And we are live. It is 12 p.m. on Wednesday, 12 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday the 13th. Welcome to Lunch and Learn with Liz. You may be surprised. We have John Grayson here, but you also may be surprised because I am indeed not Liz. Um, Liz is is currently um, taking care of personal business. So she asked me to fill in, which I am very grateful to be here and thankful to Liz for letting me be here and uh, and collaborate with uh, Dr. Grayson. So with that, as always, please let us know you're here. Say hello. Let us know where you're from. And we always like to give a couple minutes for people to get signed in and uh, get settled. And then we'll, we'll start in roughly a minute and 20 seconds. So just say hello. How are you, John? Hello. I'm doing very well. I mean, it feels a little weird to say that. Uh, so I'm just very lucky and I'm doing well. So, well, we're glad you're doing well. And it, it, I don't think that's that weird. I think it's okay to be well. Yeah. Well, okay. Now that I have permission, I feel so much better. My my guilt is now gone. I'm here to alleviate Thank any you. guilt. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. I'm here to alleviate any and all guilt. Um, if you're just joining us, please say hello. Let us know you're here. Let us know where you're from. Uh, this is 12 p.m. on Wednesday. This is Lunch and Learn with Liz. I am so happily filling in for Liz today. Our, our topic today is compulsive staring with the um, one and only Dr. Jonathan Grayson, who whose name we invoke on a regular basis. I invoke his name daily. Um, it's a true story though. Hi, Emily from the UK. Thank you for, for being here and watching. Um, we'll get started in pretty much in 20 seconds, but it's always a pleasure to have Dr. Grayson on. Um, he's a formidable presence and uh, and and uh, and and honestly, uh, just a, an amazing guy and brilliant clinician. So, um, and one of my favorite people. So I'm super excited um, to be here. And uh, oh, great! We'll post a link to the survey, John. Uh, oh, good for you. Hi, Melissa Price. Welcome, welcome. We'll be talking to Melissa in a, in a week or two. Uh, Lahoma and Bixby, Oklahoma, is here. Hello from Pakistan and founder of Universal Mental Health Forum on Instagram. Welcome, thank you so much for being here. Um, it is 20 seconds past the two minute mark, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, as always, hi Deirdre, good to see you. As always, uh, let us know you're here, say hello, let us know where you're from. Um, so first of all, welcome to Lunch and Learn with Liz. I am the substitute co-host today. My name is Ethan Smith. I'm a national advocate for the International OCD Foundation, which simply means I have OCD and like to talk uh, talk about it on a regular basis. Let's get through some quick housekeeping so we can jump into conversation with Dr. Grayson. So uh, this Lunch and Learn with Liz is intended to serve as educational content and is not intended to replace therapy. For treatment-related questions, please be sure to work with your local provider or contact a local clinician. The International OCD Foundation is not a crisis hotline and uh, should not be used if you are in distress or feeling unsafe. If you are in crisis or ever feeling suicidal or unsafe, please go to your local emergency room, call 911, or call the Suicide Prevention Hotline at 800-273-8255. If you haven't joined uh, Lunch and Learn with Liz before, um, uh, the live stream is dedicated to clinical discussions on OCD and related disorders. Um, as always, we want to encourage you to be respectful and kind. This is a safe space. We are on the internet, but this is we try to make this as safe a space as possible where we can all connect, learn about something new, and support each other. So, uh, But always keep in mind that this is also going to live on the interwebs for at least eternity. So, um, but with that being said, I want to introduce our guest for today. We have Dr. Jonathan Grayson. Hello, Dr. Grayson. It's good to see you. Hi there. Hi there. Do you think for the remainder of the interview, you could call me John or that's not a shot in hell? Uh, I watch Liz. Liz I, I generally call you Jay or J-Man or J-Dog, but Liz refers to you as Dr. Grayson. So I was trying to keep her rules alive. Okay. okay. You, you want, you, yeah, yeah. You know, or you could just go with Grayson, you know, if you can't say John. Grayson. Yeah, no, I'll go with John. Hey, Grayson. We'll okay. work with John. So just to give you a bit about John's background, John is a licensed psychologist director of the Grayson Center and adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry in the behavioral sciences at the University of Southern California, where he lectures and supervises residents. Dr. Grayson has been specializing in the treatment of obsessive compulsive disorder for more than 40 years and is a nationally recognized expert and author of Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, a Personalized Recovery Program for Living with Uncertainty, a Self-Help Guide 
for sufferers. Um, it is a book that I recommend multiple times on a daily basis. And I know Liz does as well. So if you are at home and those of you that always ask about, you don't have access to a clinician or you want to do work on your own, please, please, please go check out Freedom from OCD. It is the best book um, on this subject out. Um, in October 2020, the Association Behavioral, uh, nope, I skipped something. Sorry about that. In 2010, the International OCD Foundation awarded Dr. Grayson with a Lifetime Achievement Award for his devotion and contributions to the treatment of those with OCD. Uh, basically, Dr. Grayson has won tons and tons of awards and merits. He has written multiple articles and chapters, uh, numerous books, videotapes, uh, articles. He's been recognized nationally on um, magazines, talk shows, um, news segments. He serves on both the Scientific Advisory Board of the Speakers Bureau of the International OCD Foundation. In 1981, along with Gail Frankel, uh, he started the first support group in the country for OCD. In 2015, he helped to form and donate his time to a free goal. Goal is in all caps support group in LA. If you don't know about Dr. Grayson's or John's, uh, we, he goes by either, but he prefers I call him John. Uh, goal group, I had the pleasure of attending while I was in Los Angeles when he first started, in fact, uh, bringing his 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 uh, his program over from the Philadelphia area. His, his people look to his group, his support group, his goal group when they're starting to, to start a goal group or a group in their own area. Um, it is a wonderful, wonderful uh, support group and just uh, opportunity for sufferers and individuals with OCD and related disorders to come together. And, and, and it, we're very grateful to John and his work in developing goal. Uh, finally, he has the distinction of being first and possibly the only professional to run a yearly OCD camping trip. If you haven't been to the conference and haven't attended his virtual OCD camping, uh, it is an experience unlike any other. Um, it's an amazing experience and one in which you may see him get arrested or try to get arrested. Uh, we, we appreciated that time and, uh, we hope to see it again in the near future. So with all of that, uh, yes, Deirdre wrote through Pringles on the floor. It's just one of his many, uh, one of his many fun things he has us do. <laughs> How are you doing today, John? Uh, I am doing well. Thank you very much. Um, so with all of that in mind, I want to welcome all of you. So today's subject, we are talking about compulsive staring. Um, and I think the first question is a pretty valid question, which is, John, what is compulsive staring? So it, it's a form of OCD. And what's shocking about it is it's not new. You know, I think I first ran into it 35 plus years ago. But it is the form of OCD that's like, completely underrepresented, no research, no nothing on it, very little. Uh, I've written a little bit about it. Fred Penzel's written a little bit about it, but for the most, and some other professionals are aware of it. But before I keep talking about who's aware of it, I guess I should say exactly what it is. So at its core, um, we're talking about a group of people who don't want to be staring at uh, genitals or breasts, but find themselves doing it. So they don't want to do it. They find themselves doing it. So this gets them into a lot of trouble, you know, and um, and it becomes OCD because, you know, it takes all of their attention, you know, is constantly worried about it. We know that some of and, and there are a few groups of people with this. So one group actually doesn't stare. They think they're staring. They're pretty sure they think they've got data from the environment that they're doing it, but they're actually not doing it. Mm -hmm. We are, we're pretty sure there is another group that, that, although they will spend some of the time worried that they, that they actually do it, you know, that they actually find them in a situation where it's like, you know, they're going somewhere, it's like, I can't stare, I know I can't do this, and they find that their eyes drop, um, you know, and, and that they periodically get caught. And, and in this group, you know, we have people who will, you know, say they've lost jobs, you know, uh, when we speak with Melissa, you know, next time you and I, the three of us get together, you know, she'll be talking about some of her experiences. Uh, so we feel like we have people who have actually been caught. We're, we're pretty sure that that's true. And in trying to look at like, well, when does this happen? You know, because again, I, I guess for, for, for the listeners listening going like, what? Uh, but imagine if you're talking to somebody who has some horrible deformity on part of their face. So you know you can't stare at it. And there you are talking and like it's there you know now the difference is that for this problem the people 
don't want to stare at. In other words, like you kind of want to stare at that thing and look at it. So, so the weird place where it overlaps is you can understand the feeling of like not wanting to look, but like kind of want to. In this case, the person doesn't want to look. And so, you know, in the same way that if you have, uh, you know, OCD over sexual orientation, am I gay or am I straight and everything, you know, you're worried like, you know, they, often those people say, I'm not really this way, but this is what I'm worried about. So it's like, yeah, they don't want to do this. And, and it's not necessarily sex like it's not like oh they basically it's inappropriate that's where they're doing it so it's not like oh you know it's a guy is just looking at women it's like no i'm looking at guys too and i'm not gay and they go through that whole explanation um we find that there are for a while i thought i had the magic link but i was wrong i don't like to admit that often um well you know when we speak you know, normally make eye contact. When we start thinking, you know, a lot of time we look up in the air and we're doing all this other stuff for the rise that we have no idea that we're not doing direct eye contact. And for a while I thought, oh, this is it. During that moment, you know, you know, because we're trying to start asking people a lot more specific data about when do you do it. It's like that's the moment when they're doing it, when they're speaking and they're not really paying attention. And that does cover a bunch of people, but not everybody. You know, so we found that that people seem to do it at different times. Um, I can keep going on, but, but I thought I'd let you insert a question to make it look like it's a conversation. <laughs> no, I, I think that this is, you know, this, this subject, you brought this subject to my attention. I think it's necessary to hear as much about it as possible. I'll, I'll in, in a rare, in a rare hour, I will try to speak as little as possible in, in an effort to get as much information about this topic as possible. Um, I have a bunch of questions, and I know Arlene, I see your question. It's a great question. I'm going to get to it in one moment. Also, hello from Iraq. Thank you for being here. We have a Middle Eastern contingency, which is really, really exciting. Um, how common is it? That's such a wonderful question. Nobody has any idea. This problem, this form of OCD, there is no data. So Melissa, who who is somebody who has this and after years of suffering, almost got and got got very like pissed off in a sense, and we're like, "Fine, I'm just coming out. Like we've got to do something about this." And and so she's wonderfully brave. Um, and, and she and I have, and there's going to be a link that Fran's going to put up of a survey. We're like literally collecting the first data. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed very rare because uh, he didn't hear about it much. However, about ten years ago, I started a blog, and uh, a woman wrote to me about her obsessive staring problem. And uh, I wrote her the advice and the you know treatment that we had at the time. That particular blog uh, piece, I had more hits on that over the years than anything else. Mm. Uh, so I, partially I'm an accidental expert because I'm like one of the few places you can find anything written by a professional. You know, I have a little short, very short section in my book about it. But that's like one of the few things. So it's amazing, like even over this 10 year period. So the, the blog indirectly led to many of the sufferers getting together and forming some online groups. So so they basically found each other. And it's like, OK, I don't know the actual number, what proportion it's not a it's not like the most common form of OCD, but way more. You know, it's kind of like reminds me when I first worked with OCD, when it was considered a rare disorder back in the ancient prehistoric days. I remember talking to enough people when I tell them what I would do, and they always knew somebody with OCD. And I thought, like, okay, this can't really be as rare as it seems. And then finally, when the epidemiological study was done, it's like, oh, not really rare, you know, like roughly one in 50 people have OCD. So it's like, uh, I don't think it's that much, but I think it's a decent proportion. So uh, Melissa, and I'm helping her, but mainly Melissa, we're like collecting the first like general data of anything about it. One of our reasons, besides educating professionals about this, is we're hoping that uh, some of you know the, my colleagues who are more research focused would actually start researching it. You know, you know, if you want a virgin area to research, where no, you know, where you get to publish the first stuff, this would be it. I want to dive in because I have some written questions, of course, for you. But but now I'm curious because the way you broke it down into two segments, one I can identify as very o seems like OCD. It's this idea that what if I do this thing? I might have done this thing. I don't remember exactly. I have uncertainty around it. Am I willing to live with the uncertainty that I may or may not have done it? 
And that mm -hmm. feels very familiar to me. It, you could substitute any subtype or symptom and that feels exactly. very familiar to me. But the, se the second uh, demographic that you talk about, would that be akin to like, well, I'm afraid of doing X, but I'm actually doing it. It, it, does that also fall in the OCD realm? Could I could I make that association like, well, I'm afraid I'm going to harm my mother, but I actually harm my mother all the time? Um, yeah, and you know, we could have that overlap where reality crosses over, not not real frequent. Um, you know, that that is the one thing that's right different than other presentations of OCD. You know, I mean, you said, but there's definitely an OCD part because there are times people think they're doing it. And, and kind of, you know, there are those forms of OCD where somebody is sure they have bad breath or sure they smell. And, you know, the, the data they collect that's convincing to them, uh, you know, but if you listen to it, it's not as clear. Like somebody gave me a mint that proves it, you know, or, you know, somebody turned their head that proves it. Um, so we're not, uh, so, so there is a part that where they engage in the typical OCD and, and their evidence is that. Uh, some of the behaviors they do to avoid staring and then and they would do this you know if i'm really staring i'm still going to do this is like okay i have to maintain my absolute consciousness of where my eyes are while i'm talking so i'm going to stare at you i start to look weird right i'm not i'm looking in an unnatural way so we have to teach people to stare in a normal way um so so we know some of it's that but your, to your question how does this occur? You know, and now I said, I, I really thought it was cool. And I thought it's like, oh, well, they're unconsciously doing it. And so it's not really, you know, but people report other things. So we've come up with something and uh, we're talking to Charlie Mansueto about it. Um, you know, Charlie has this concept of Tourettic OCD. You know, it's OCD, but there's, you know, a touch of kind of impulsiveness, impulsive behavior, you know, in the sense of I, I can't quite control it. Um, and so we think that for a portion of the people, that they're probably there. They're very well may be a, a Tourettic kind of component, you know. Uh, now, Charlie points out that he would think in talking about this group, that's not that is not describing the entire group uh, that, you know, we have to do a good analysis of the people to find out, you know, that there's probably a few subtypes within this. We agree, except uh, if you have this problem, you know, uh, uh, and and you you know if you might be doing it like how am I going to cope with this problem and and uh, besides what we kind of do for treatment and for this problem I think our treatments okay it's not like other forms of OCD it can be a really hard treatment it can be really hard for the person to come to acceptance this one I feel like we don't you know and I, I have successfully treated some people and I don't think this is like this definitely works so we need to modify treatment but. If I'm going to try to explain to somebody what I'm doing, you know, and some people would say, well, I have compulsive staring, obsessive staring. That's not useful because nobody knows what the heck it is. So if I go to you and I tell you, here's my problem and I stare at genitals, it's like, OK, they're just not going to buy it at all. And you're weird. So what we've been suggesting to people with this and we think it's probably we think there might be some truth. But, you know, neurological way you can is we suggest people to tell them that they have Tourette's. You know, you know how some people curse into this interest. This is my Tourette's symptom. Feel free to point it out. Because I think in the general population, there is that concept. So it's part of our treatment in a sense. It's part of the coping with it as a way to, you know, take some of the pressure off. Because again, some people will say this happens in every situation. Some people, the more important it is that they don't stare, the worse it's going to happen. You know, so, um, you know, some people tell you, like, I have no trouble with a therapist. Because I know there are therapists that aren't going to care, so it doesn't happen. Other people, it's going to happen everywhere. Uh, so I, so I have some need to explain it, and I feel like this. Oh, it's Tourette's now. So, so we're trying to rename it. You know, we came up, you know, with our little name, calling it OTO. OTO is way easier to say than ocular Tourettic OCD. Um, but we think that 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 might be a meaningful name to to throw everything under. Did I answer your question? I can't remember no. now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and I want to encourage people to uh, please ask questions. We will probably move into the question phase in the next 10 minutes. And Arlene, I promise I will answer your question first. I really want to differentiate and, and even dive even deeper and, and clarify this OTO we'll use. But, but 
I, I would imagine it can get messy in the sense that in my own experiences with OCD, there were times where I would find myself staring at genitals and question my sexuality or at, at any male or female or question, mm -hmm. uh, am I cheating? Am I, how, how do you differentiate between when it's another subtype of OCD that involves staring? Like I can't help, I have to look at this um, because, and, and am I attracted because I'm looking at this? Is, does that start to converge with OCD staring? Are they, are they different enough that it doesn't? I think you've laid out a perfect difference. You know, in what you're describing, it's part of checking. You, it's not that you're interested in staring, right? You know, you, you're, you're trying to establish something to, to figure something out. Um, there, there's no, there's no urge to, there's no urge to stare. I mean, that's what kind of makes it a little teretic. It's, it's not, you know, there's no, there's no thought like I want to stare and I have to avoid it. Now, you know, now that you and I are speaking about it, maybe we'll reach enough people that there'll be that person who who has that problem. I want to stare and I'm not sure if I'm staring and that would be, you know, comfortable. Okay, that's that's a very straightforward OCD that we might partially throw into the category. You know, what we're what we're throwing in this category is I don't want to do this. Uh, I'm not really giving into a secret urge to do it. Not, I have no I have no conscious urge to do it. It happens. Um, as opposed to, yeah, there, there's a reason, you know, I'm, I either want to do it and I'm afraid I'm doing it. it it's uh, so and that's a big differentiator is that is that the staring does not bring relief. The compulsion usually that that's not the relief. Like I the, stare, the staring answers no question. The staring, you know, and, and again, the, yeah. Yeah, there's no relief and there's, and there's no, yeah. So what are, what are like, and, and you've mentioned Melissa, Melissa Price, uh, we'll be doing a town hall in the coming weeks. I'll, I'll give the information at the end, will be joining us and, and probably give us a lot of insight from her lived experience. But A, what does it look like for someone with compulsive staring who tries to manage on their own? What are some tools that they, maybe some maladaptive behaviors that they go through? Um, and then what, what, are, what are some useful treatments exposures, techniques that, that you'd like to utilize for compulsive staring on the other side? So, so, so on its own, um, you know, often what happens is a lot of isolation, people being afraid to go out, you know, getting caught, um, losing jobs, um, you know, so, so something's happening that's getting people to lose jobs, whether, you know, it's this directly or maybe they're acting weird or both. Um, you know, there are, there are certain things like sunglasses, love sunglasses, you know, it's an avoidance behavior, but it's also a very, you know, that works really well. Um, pretty much it's all avoidance. What can I do to, to not be around this? Um, you know, so that people are afraid to, to get in those situations. So, it's, you know, it's like if I have to go somewhere to a store, you know, I'm either going to look at the clerk, I'm making sure I am just looking down at the counter, you know, I just spend the entire time looking down at the counter while I'm talking and I'm concentrating on looking at the counter. So, you know, one of the problems with it, if it's occurring, I have to be conscious every moment to make sure it doesn't occur. So that's not going to happen. Um, again, sometimes there, there's an effort to, to look at you you know, to make sure I know where my eyes are. And that tends to make me look odd because my, you know, nobody really just stares at you and doesn't ever take their eyes off it. But it's like, you know, so, so it's basically how can I avoid, can I wear my sunglasses, you know? Um, you know so, so, you know, and this is like, you know, like for social anxiety, uh, like that, the pandemic's great. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm on Zoom. Hey. You know, like I can't see your genitals yet, but um, so right, all I can see is your face. I can't do any appropriate staring. And you know, given what cameras are, you don't know where the heck I'm looking anyway. Um, but probably this isn't a lo good long-term solution. Uh, so right, so so they do those things, and and it tends to be disruptive in the way that OC can, where um, my life is way marginalized. Uh, I may be losing friends, um, so. Poorly. I can't imagine of having to be, and I'll let you answer the other half of that question, but I can't imagine 
just using my own lived experience, trying to be so hyper aware that I could have certainty around things that I was afraid I was doing, getting a drink of water, being afraid I was gonna poison myself. So I would watch myself get the drink of water. I would watch the water as I would walk every step to the table. I would sit down, I would watch the water the whole time and still question, go back, pour it out and do it again. Um, the answer to that is just don't get my own water. Somebody else can get it and that alleviates my anxiety. But you know, when you think about having your eyes open and, and the pain that must, you must go through what this has gone through and anybody else having to try to monitor what you're staring at the whole time as long as you're, I, I would imagine sleep is the best relief um you know well i think unfortunately right i think many sufferers like that's the best time oh yeah totally yeah you know, outside of having ocd dreams right so let's go to um what does at, at this time what does uh treatment for compulsive staring look like what are some so, techniques so the, the original treatment we're not sure who made it up, Fred Pinzel or me. I thought I did, but he said he did, so uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, but I think I came up with the name. Uh, we call it sneak peek. You know, we were, you know, the one thing we were sure of is people are like attempting really hard to not stare. And uh, that's exhausting. Um, so, so in an effort, so, so part of treatment, obviously nothing's ever simple, but so the part of treatment was like, okay, we want you to stare, but we want you to do it sneakily. We want you to get away with it. And in a sense, this is normal behavior, right? Again, if I'm talking to that person with some horrible thing on their face, like, like, you know, it's like, okay, like, you know, when can I look, you know, or, uh, again, somebody's wearing something and I want to stare. It's like, we try to sneak a peek. So, so we do that. And. You know, as with our OCD, that can be really overwhelming to do with a one-on-one -on -one with an individual. So, you know, we may work in an easy place. So if I send people in the old days when you could go to a mall, uh, they would, would, this would be, still be scared. I have somebody go to a mall and sit, get a coffee, and I want you to do sneak peek on passerbys. You know, so we have a really pretty safe situation. Because, um, again, normally if they're at a mall, passerbys don't really affect them at all because it's not enough interaction. So it's not like they're worried, I'm gonna be staring and somebody's gonna catch me. Uh, I'm sure there's some group like that. So, so we, you know, it's a lower, you know, an easier situation and we would be practicing that. Um, we would talk about how to stare at somebody when you're talking to them. Cause again, it's not natural to just stare directly at your eyes. So we would have what we, uh, what Charlie Mansueto, I think he labeled it this, uh, cause he was one who suggested to me like the three point stare. So it's like, periodically taking my eyes and like kind of looking at, you know, like kind of, you know, in a gradual way, like three, pla three places around me. So my eyes do the normal kind of wandering. Um, so we have had success with some people being able to cope with it like that and that taking the pressure off, you know, and it's one of those things if the pressure is taken off, it doesn't feel like a problem. I, I think unlike other forms of OCD, again, where I feel like I might have a hard time convincing you to do treatment or to really buy into acceptance. And I feel like if I can get you to do those treatment work, this is still really hard. And we still have that issue of like, what is happening in the off time? You know, like, I and mean, how conscious do you have to be of it? You know, and that's the real problem. How conscious do you have to be of it? You know, again, it's a, a, a different form, but I think about hair pulling, um, you know, I have to be conscious when my hand drifts to my head, but you know, I can do something like put a bandaid on your finger. So, it's, oh, I can feel that. I can't make this as conscious. So we have a lot of trouble worrying about slips. Um, that, that's kind of the core right now of treatment, you know, with the staring. If we, if we can, dis, if, if I can further narrow it down, you know, we can figure out exactly when you stare, uh, what are the circumstances, then we can more target treatment, you know? So again, like for some people, it's like, okay, it's one and one's going to be a problem. Often if I'm in a conference room, it can work both ways. It can be a little worse because there's no focus, you know, so nobody's really watching me. So my eyes might drift or it can be a little easier because I can just keep staring down on purpose and not really look up and it's not going to be really be noticeable. So we, we need to figure out all the parts of where the problem is to further refine treatment. Um, but we clearly need more research. Is it important to identify which cohort they fall into for treatment? Meaning what if I stare versus the individuals that actually are staring? It, 
I think for some people it becomes obvious it's a concern that's not there, that they're not doing it. Um, there are other individuals where it seems like there's evidence they're doing it, and there's that middle group. It's always nice to know everything. It's probably not absolutely critical. You know, I mean, I think anybody with the problem, ha you know, has to acknowledge there are going to be times you think it's happening and it's not, you know, yeah. and you're misinterpreting. Um, however, um, you know, the, the, you know, so how, how do I get you to be comfortable in the situation? You know, yeah, it'd be wonderful, you know, if we could actually find out. Again, the, the sharing it, it's a very gutsy move. And I, I don't think everybody can handle doing it. But I feel if I get out that hole, I have Tourette's and this is it. I feel that takes a lot of pressure off. It's like, hey, you're doing that again. Oh, sorry. You know, that, that you know, we're like, like kind of normalizing it in that sense. Um, but it's, you know, I, I, yeah, you know, like certain issues that would be really good to know. Uh, is it the social anxiety go frequently with this problem? Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, you know, there's some forms of OCD that where there's also a lot of social anxiety at the same time, you know, and we kind of know that so we can deal with it. That's a great unknown question. You know, the people I've treated, uh, I, I can't say that I have a sense that that is always characteristic, you know, or, or even frequently characteristic. So I'm sure that a group for it's true, but yeah, we need to know those kind of things. But the actual staring, I, I don't necessarily have to know because it's not going to majorly change treatment. I mean, right, the one thing is we can't do straight exposure. It's like, let's go into stare genitals. What's interesting, uh, oh, go ahead, John. That's it. You know, um, we talked about, when we met earlier, we talked about it, and I talked about some some staring in, in my history that I had done um, just as compulsion, and it's very clear that that was not compulsive staring. But something came to mind just now, and I'm just going to offer it up because maybe it's information for the, for, for the data that you're collecting. But, you know, when I was at my sickest um, and, and really just enveloped in OCD and listening to it, that's when all kinds of symptomatology appeared. I had never done before. I had my mm -hmm. primary, I was washing my hands and I was checking things that I had never done. And I just thought of this while you were talking. And one of the things was when I was, when I had started going to therapy um, and doing ERP, one of the psychologists that came in, I could not stop staring at his genitals. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it was not, I wasn't asking myself a question. I didn't want to be doing it. But when mm -hmm. he walked in the room or walked in the door, and he was never my therapist, so he would walk around or come in the room, my eyes would just go there, and I couldn't stop. And I was like, why am I staring at this guy's genitals? I don't want to be doing this. And I was like, I was looking at the shape and the so I mean, I was really examining, and I, it brought me so much distress. And I'd forgotten I did that until this conversation. And it probably mm -hmm. went on two or three months. Now, I was able to talk about it because I was in a clinical setting. And they were able to expose me by him saying, yeah, I hope you're looking. I hope you're, you know, they really did an ERP version of it to me. And it sort mm -hmm. of went away as my OCD got less because he didn't care. So I didn't care. And you don't have that luxury when you're in a social situation. But right. I'd completely forgotten that I did that. Is that is that kind of what we're talking about? Well, you know, as soon as you say it, I wonder, you know what I mean? It's like, like you know, a few things got really lucky. So what would have happened if that happened in the real world? So that the way OCD does, it starts to spread. So now it's no longer that individual, it becomes every individual. So, you know, now, now I no longer can say like, okay, come in, stare at my genitals. And it's like, uh, you know, I'm not worried about you. So I don't give a, I don't really care, you know? So that, that was, you know, like, like you may have been really lucky. Like it was just caught at the critical moment where it could be nipped in the bud. Uh, and maybe could have grown, but it feels like, you know, there's, there's an aspect of that. Yeah. That, that there, you know, everything, where, all, the, all the sort of weird stuff that manifested during that time fell off, you know, the hand washing and things like that. And that was one of them. They just kind of disappeared. And as I got better, that stuff went to the wayside very quickly. Arlene, I am so sorry. I want to bring to Arlene's, <laughs> Arlene's question. Hopefully you're still on. And I also want to encourage if anybody has any questions here on compulsive staring or anything else, we have Dr. Grayson, he's your man. So Arlene asked at 12.08 p.m., hi, Ethan and Dr. John, I've been trying to see you since 2008. I would imagine she's talking about you, not me. <clears throat> but I'm in Toronto. Can OCD staring be a biological disorder, for example, if patients diagnosed with hormonal cancer like neurodocrine, 
I, I think I said that right, cancer and not psychological disorder? Um, well, you know, OCD is both learned and biological. That is, you know, we're, we're relatively sure that there's definitely a biological part of OCD that you've got to have the genes and it's got to be active. And, you know, the part that we think is psychological is what is the form that OCD takes? So in that sense, I, I think there's an underlying biology. Is there a very specific biology, particular to OCD staring? And, and as somebody who's not a neuroscientist, my answer should be meaningless, but uh, I, I would not think it's different than regular OCD in terms of biology, but you know, I'm making this up at this moment. Um, there's not a good reason to suspect that yet. It's going to be cool if there were some researches. You know, for the most part, I can say that we don't see major neurological or biological differences between different manifestations of OCD, you know, in a way that we could put somebody through a biological test and go like, oh, as a hand washer. Uh, so, you know, to suggest that maybe this we'd be able to ultimately do that uh, anything is possible, but I, I, I probably doubt it. Well, let me give you a little bit more insight. She's been conversing with Melissa on the uh, on the thread. So just to give you a little bit more background on Arlene, we know that she has been a cancer patient diagnosed 2015. She wrote, I've been suffering with OCD staring since 2003. I was born with hormonal problems, serotonin and dopamine issues. I have tried every form of medication, but I developed serotonin syndrome and almost died in 2012. We don't have much research and help out here in Canada, could this OCD be foreshadow a biological, like a change of genetics, hormonal disposition? I do use exposure therapy. I taught myself how, and then it actually cuts it off. So just a bit more background into her experience. Um, you know, again, I think, I think, uh, right. You know, one of the things that when, you know, cause I'm so old on before SSRIs, um, you know, I remember they would come out with drugs and say they work and there are no side effects. And it was always like, yeah, that's not going to happen. So I remember when Prozac first came out and I expected like, yep, here's another one that's going to do nothing. Uh, and it's like, oh, wait, this, this, uh, it's not the cure all, but it actually helps. Uh, however, of all the people Prozac helped, there's a group of people that that SSRI doesn't work for. You know, so we've got six SSRIs that are in theory are equal in theory have no side effects and individually right it's just random and some and then there are people who don't respond to ssris so i do think that you know she's in a position where there's probably something biological that could be done that would be helpful uh i know with most ocd you know what we see is again meds alone 25 to 50 percent symptom reduction if they're working but the learn part is so powerful, it often overshadows that. So, I mean, I think at a certain point, you're still stuck with me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it seems like, you know, she could be in this unfortunate case where, you know, it's almost like an SSRI would work, but it's not quite the right drug or she I can't take it. Uh, so, yeah, I think there are potentially other treatments. I think uh, it'd be... I feel like for it to have a medication that just eradicated OCD completely, I mean, that would be cool. Um, but I think for that to really work, I'd have to give the drug before you became OCD. Like, I think if I could predict you were going to be, you know, you're about to, your OCD is about to hit and we could give you the SSRI then and you never got to experience OCD because the SSRI worked, I think we could completely avoid OCD for you. You know, the trouble is we always give it after it's begun to develop and you, you know, you start to have a history and, uh, you know, um, what I do does not really change biology and drugs don't really change learning, but they certainly are really important to making it easier. So um, I, I think, you know, she's right that there is, you know, for her, what's going to work. Like it's not at a point that they have found the right thing for her, you know, like and then. Uh, can we get way more sophisticated? And the answer is a definite maybe. Thank you, Dr. Grayson. And thank you, Arlene, uh, for, for, for being so open and honest. I know you've been talking with Melissa in the comment thread. Now seems an appropriate time to say on January 21st, which is a Thursday at 7 p.m., we'll be hosting a town hall on this very topic with Dr. Grayson 
and Melissa will be joining us, who will offer all kinds of insight on her own lived experience with, uh, with compulsive staring. So please, Arlene, we invite you and anyone else um, to come join us uh, at 7 p.m. on the 21st, where we'll continue this discussion as well. Great question from our friend in Iraq. We appreciate this. Uh, moving uh, over a second, he wrote how to do ERP alone, which is a question we get all the time. Uh, if somebody were to, you know, have your book, Dr. Grayson, you know, wow, that's a great, I know it's a big question, but what are some thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think the question reflects partially our ignorance in this area. That is, uh, I, I think doing ear appeal on one's own is very hard. You know, I, I, I tried to be as explicit and simplified in my book as I could, you know, and give as many steps as possible. Uh, I still think it's really hard to do on one's own, um, which is the, you know, saying like, oh, I think there's some ways this is harder. Um, you know, so I said, we have the, you know, can I start learning to do this sneak peek? And do I need to start doing it in an easier situation than a hard one? Because I, de you know, I definitely have clients where the idea of doing this one-on-one -on -one with somebody they know that's like that is way too high on the hierarchy. We have to start in a safer place where you know I'm more distant from the people. So I, you know, again, that's why I pick a mall, you know, and then kind of up from the mall we might go like making a purchase, you know. So going up to somebody and doing that. Of course, you know, I'm not sure what the situation is in Iraq, you know, and, uh, but if, if they're as bad as Southern California, you know, nobody's really making purchases right now. But, um, but yes, you know, can I do it in those really quick interactions where it's a short time and it's like lower, you know, lower. So I'm trying to get in the habit where my consciousness is not entirely devoted. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Where, you know, I'm kind of splitting it to like, okay, I'm taking that pressure off. Um, when I'm talking to somebody and I don't, cause I don't know if this part's in the book, I feel like it might not be, um, you know, if I'm looking at somebody to, you know, it's not normal to just keep staring at the eyes. So, you know, like periodically, you know, purposely like, okay, you know, look at the air for a second and then like look up at this, you know, like over their head and look to the left and, you know, and very practice doing it in a casual way. It's great if you happen to have a partner because, right, the partner can, you know, you can practice this with a partner. They can tell you like this looks weird or no, like, you know, okay, yeah, you're looking normal when you're speaking to me. Uh, so, so I think those are things to make it socially easier um that core issue of like do i think i have evidence that this person caught me and whether they're actually doing it or not we have to treat that like ocd that is maybe but unless they say like what are you staring at um, and even then, because I'm, if I'm just doing like a direct stare into your eyes and I look weird, I might be getting that, you know, it's got, you know, so I feel for me to know it's like OCD. It's like, why are you staring at my breasts or why are you looking at my groin? You know, they, you know, and they would take a really uh, assertive person to say that to you. But like, if they say that to you, cool. You know, um, I'm not even sure if they say, are you trying to hit on me? Um, because what are you staring at? exactly. Um, you know, if I had a lot of guts, I could practice saying, oh, I have this Tourette's problem, you know, and I can say that if you wanted to do the I have a Tourette's problem, you need to say to talk out loud in your room to say exactly what you would say to the person, because under the pressure of the situation, it would be really difficult. And whatever you're thinking, you would say if you have never said it before it's not likely to come out right. So I would like you to have the out loud imaginary conversation in the room of how you're going to try to explain this Tourette's OCD and until you at least sound convincing to you, you know, and you like the way your voice sounds. Uh, so, you know, you could practice that. Now that many people would find that idea like terrifying and too overwhelming. And so it's like, it does take some pressure off, but it's very hard. And, you know, where am I, can I do that? Um, you know, I think I could get away with that more in the States. You know, I know in some cultures, uh, I can't really say I have OCD. You know, like, you know, it's one thing about family doesn't accept it, but the culture does it, you know, but the culture is okay with it. So, I mean, to, to admit I have a problem, right, 
depends on these other issues that you know are not necessarily in control. You know, I, I remember treating somebody in Kazakhstan. Uh, we did successful treatment, but she didn't tell anybody. Her, her mom knew, uh, but she got married, and even though she still was doing explosion stuff, she like never told her husband. Um, so you know, because it would be dire problems if she did. I, I don't know if she was right, but you know, that's what she told me. So. Um, I think I can do those things. So the idea that I'm going to eliminate that a stare ever occurs, that's probably not a reasonable goal. Um, I, I can't say, you know, so, so what, you know, what we're trying to do is get some control over it and try to help you get less concern over it. Um, I said, for the people I've treated who, for whom this did work, um, it felt to them that their lack of concern, you know, as they felt more control, they became less concerned and it felt to them it wasn't happening. Um, so I can call that a success. Um, I can't guarantee, you know, so we're, we're trying to at least get to that, to have more control over your life. I think it's going to be variable the level of success in terms of how much, how much am I, Feel like I'm able to function this way, but I'm not comfortable versus not functioning. So I think it's an improvement. I think we can get that. Do I can I get to the next level? Is a maybe. Thanks, John. Uh, Sylvia, twelve, and hopefully that helped. Um, we we definitely know, especially in Middle Eastern countries, how stigmatized mental health is in general, not just OCD um, and, and Muslim communities and and and, and all, all areas of faith. Um, so. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, Sylvia at 12.37 p.m. asked, does compulsive staring combined with harm OCD? Not automatically. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, the people I see with compulsive staring do not also have harm OCD. Um, you know, so if this person is feels like they're kind of somehow doing both, well, I believe you're doing both. And so, you know, you have two manifestations of OCD. You know, I, th you know, I think the thing with OCD, if you can ask me the question, uh, what if, then somewhere, someone, and maybe he was having it. So um, it's not an autom it's not a thing that's automatically combined. You know, like I, I can say, like, often if I see somebody with BDD, body dysmorphic disorder, I often find that they've been like some a, a bit of a perfectionist in school. Like they would be trying to like write perfect papers and, and perfect in the sense of like, you know, the handwriting is perfect and, you know, everything looks pretty. Um, so I've seen like a relation between those commonly, not always, but commonly. In my clinical experience, I haven't seen it uh, in the initial, you know, Melissa, you know, Melissa, a little bit with my help, but mainly Melissa, we developed this initial survey that you can access here if you have this problem. And, you know, one of the questions is like, do you have other forms of OCD? If so, what? You know, so, so in terms of having actual data, like there's a turn out there is something uh, that might be so. Thank you. Uh, at 12.37 p.m., Greg asks, is there a, and Melissa would be a great person to ask, I'm sure she'll weigh in, uh, is there a high level of guilt with people suffering this form of OCD? You know what's great about this form of OCD, well, not great, but this, this form of OCD that we're talking about, um, we're talking about explorers in a wilderness. Like we know it exists. Again, you know, I ran into it more than 35 years ago. And amazingly, horribly, there is like no data on this. You know, so there's, you know, so like, you know, so what you're hearing from me, you know, and it's so painful in what I don't know. But what you're hearing from me is like, uh, here's some guesses and all that we don't know. Um, definitely there are a bunch of, you know, definitely many of the people have guilt. You know, um, particularly if, if they're like all OCD, if this is affecting their ability to function and help a family, yes. Um, I think, you know, you know, certainly there's a lot of pain over loss um, and, and often guilt will accompany that. Um, you know, people who don't like themselves and have low self-esteem, guilt's always going to be a part of it because they will often blame themselves, you know, and uh, 
you know, and there's a payoff for blaming yourself because although you're doing terribly, it's kind of like if you could stop doing terribly, everything would be okay. Um, you know, I think it's really sad to have this problem, um, right? Because it's not like you asked to do this problem. It's not like, oh, why don't you just start doing X? So it, it's very easy to have poor self-esteem and, and to blame yourself uh, and have guilt in that way. Um, Melissa wrote shame. Thank you, Melissa. I knew there was a word I was looking for. <laughs> I know. <laughs> And and uh, you know if we, you know I, I there are few, there are a few things I know from Melissa that that uh, I'm letting her I'm, I'm I don't want to I'm waiting for her when we go with you together so she can say all those things because uh, she's speaking from experience but um, yes shame was the word I was looking for we can definitely depend on shame uh, you know to to what extent that involves guilt for somebody but but shame would be the big one okay well looks like we are just about out of time. I want to thank, uh, well, any final words, uh, John, on this topic before we, um, actually, we just got um, one, let's go ahead and, and sorry, John, let's go ahead and uh, ask this last question. Um, at 12.51 p.m., compulsive staring and POC, well, this is kind of the question I asked at the beginning, um, compulsive staring and POCD, sexual orientation OCD, where's the compulsive staring checking Noticing and asking, why did I notice? Did I notice X in a sexual way? And then rechecking to neutralize. Right, those are different. Right, that 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 that's staring as part of a ritual. You know, that's repeated staring to check something and to make a test. You know, like you know, and and you know, there is the there, there would be the sub part of that, like why am you know why am I staring? You know, I mean, there's the part where I know why I'm staring to check, and there's the other part like. Was I staring because this means something? You know, like I looked at that kid as QA. Why was I staring at that kid in the first place? Um, that's straight OCD. You know, that that is that is more common OCD, and and we you know we know what to do. That we know what the feared consequences are. Um, we know what the consequences of staring are, um, and we know for the OC part of it what the feared consequences are. That, that other part is there this teoretic component where it it just does occur. In which case we would have a kind of a teoretic type treatment for that piece of it that wouldn't be total. Okay. Well, thank you for that question. Oh, did you go ahead? Oh, I was done. Okay, <laughs> I wasn't sure. All right. So with that, John, any final words before we uh, we sign off? Well. You know, just the hope that I, I hope that this starts to get researched because it's um, it's not a niche problem that's so small it doesn't deserve it. I know I know when we brought it up to some some members of the foundation, they're like, "What?" And until we, when we started talking about it, it's like, "Oh wait, this is like really a, this is like an area I didn't even realize existed." Um, if we were lucky, this would be the last frontier. You know, at least of finding a new form of OCD. I can always hope. Um, you know, and so that's that's I really appreciate what you're doing and you know letting us begin to bring this to light. Uh, so that maybe like in two or three years, you know, we can say like, oh, all right, well here we've got the treatment, you know, and um, uh, I think that's it. All right. Thank you. No, no. Well, thank you, John. Thank you to our guest, uh, Dr. John Grayson, for being here. Thank you for spending your lunch hour with us and asking questions. Uh, if you have any additional questions for myself, for Liz, for Dr. Grayson, please don't hesitate to email us at info at iocdf.org. We'll make sure that your question is answered uh, by the individual it was intended for and, and get an answer uh, back to you. So thank you, thank you. And as always, thank you for advocating in the comments. We really appreciate everyone. We also appreciate it's a price for weighing in on her lived experience via the comment thread. If you're interested in hearing Melissa's story live and in person along with Dr. Grace, and I definitely encourage you to join us on January 21st at 7 p.m. That's a Thursday. We'll be hosting an hour and a half discussion on this very topic. We've got lots of questions, more information, and most importantly, we have Melissa joining us who can give us um, some insight uh, from her. Go ahead. I, I just and, and as a further uh, to listen, because uh, Melissa has been incredibly brave. So she's done this thing that is terrifying. She's gone back and asked people, including people who she knows rejected her, to ask them about what did you notice. So 
she has some personal data about what people noticed or didn't notice about her staring. So she's like, maybe the, you know, maybe there's some other people in the world, but she's the only public person in the world we know who's gone back and done some exploration into like what's actually happened. That's amazing. Well, we look forward yeah. to having her and you. And thank you, Melissa. Uh, we'll all walk in your footsteps, honestly. Um, as you just saw, if you, if you want to put that graphic back up, Fran, um, you can check out all the virtual events coming up um, at iocdf.org forward slash peace of mind uh, for all upcoming programming. Um, also, we're accepting proposals for the upcoming conferences. Yes, that's plural. Um, if there's something you've always wanted to see but haven't seen it, submit it. Uh, we've got, I think, five virtual conferences coming on. Uh, there it is. Uh, so you can submit a proposal. Ignore my cat. The tail is about to get in the frame here. Um, <laughs> we Here, hold on. Ugh. Unplanned. Uh, we couldn't be certain that she wouldn't bomb this. Anyway, uh, feel free to submit at a 2021 virtual event at iocdf.org forward slash 2021 events. Um, we're doing another virtual conference. We've got a hoarding conference. We've got kids, get tons and tons of stuff. So please be sure to check it out. Um, also, if you haven't already and you want to be notified about all the programming the IOCDF is having over the next month, be sure to subscribe and follow on Facebook and YouTube as well as you can follow us and uh, check us out on Twitch as well. We're just, we're everywhere. Um, actually, just leave that up. John looks great. Uh, I like that. <laughs> Good luck for John. Um, so uh, you can also check out the online calendar for all upcoming virtual events as well. With that, thank you again to our guest, Dr. Grayson. Thank you to the IOCDF. Thank you to Liz for letting me fill in for her. I appreciate it. She's Big shoes to fill, so thank you very much. And thank you to Fran behind the scenes for doing all his digital voodoo. With that, have a wonderful day. Stay safe, stay vigilant, feel the feels. Don't let OCD off the hook, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.